The Continued Story of Terran, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you've stayed to listen. Now sit round, as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 7. Caw. Terran stopped short. You know that? he asked in surprise. Then why didn't you... Gwistle gulped and darted nervous glances about him. Oh, well... I know, but only in a very general way, you understand. I mean, I don't really know anything at all. Just the usual unfounded rumor you might expect to hear in a beastly place like this. Of no importance. Pay no attention to it. Gwistle, said Dully sharply. You know more about this than you're letting on. Now, out with it. The gloomy creature flung his hands to his head and began moaning and rocking back and forth. Do go away and let me alone, he sobbed. I'm not well. I have so many tasks to finish. I shall never be cut up. You must tell us, cried Terran. Please, he added, lowering his voice, for the wretched crystal had begun to shake violently, his eyes turning up as though he were about to have a fit. Do not keep your knowledge from us. If you stay silent, our lives are risked for no purpose. Leave it alone. Gwistle choked, fanning himself with an edge of his robe. Don't bother with it. Forget it. That's the best thing you can do. Go back wherever you came from. Don't even... Don't even think about it. How can we? Terran cried. Aron won't rest until he has the cauldron of gar of again. But of course he won't rest, Gwistel said. He isn't resting now. That's exactly why you should drop the search and go quietly. You only stir up more trouble, and there's enough of that already. Then we had better get back to Karakadarn and join Gwydion as quickly as we can, Elenry said. Yes, yes, by all means, broke in Gwistle with the first trace of eagerness Darren had glimpsed in this strange individual. I only give you this advice for your own good. I'm glad, very glad you've seen fit to follow it. Now, of course, he added almost brightly, you'll want to be on your way very wise of you. I unhappily have to stay here. I envy you. Really, really I do. But that's the way of it, and there's little anyone can do. A pleasure meeting all of you. Goodbye. Goodbye, cried Elmy. If we put our noses above ground and the huntsmen are waiting for us, yes, it will be good die indeed. Dully says it's your duty to help us, and with that, you haven't done a thing, except sigh and moan. If this is the best the fair folk can man manage, why, I'd rather be up a tree with my toes tied together. Gwistle clutched his head again. Please don't shout. I'm not up for shouting today. Not after the horses. One of you can go and see if the huntsmen are still there. Not that it will really do any good, for they might have just stepped away for a moment. I wonder who will do that, muttered the dwarf. Good old Dolly, of course. I thought I'd done with making myself invisible. I could give you all a little something, Gwistle went on. Not that it will do you much good. It's kind of a powder I've put by in case. I was saving it for emergencies. What do you call this, you clot? Dolly growled. Yes, well, I meant uh, more for personal emergencies, Gwistle explained, paling. But it doesn't it doesn't really matter. You can have it. Take it all. Go go ahead, take it. You put it on your feet, or whatever you walk on, I mean hooves and so forth, Gwistel added. It doesn't work too well, hardly much sense in bothering because it wears off. Naturally if you're walking on it it would do that. However, it will hide your tracks uh for a while. That's exactly what we need, said Darren. Once we throw the huntsmen off our trail, I think we can outrun them. I'll get some, said Gwistle with eagerness. It won't take but a moment. As he made to leave the chamber, however, Dully took him by the arm. Gwistle, said the dwarf severely, you have a skulking, sneaking look in your eyes. You might hoodwink my friends, but you're, don't forget you're also dealing with one of the fair folk. I have a feeling, Dully added, tightening his grip. You're far too anxious to see us gone. I'm beginning to wonder if I squeezed you a little bit harder. What more might want to come out? At this, Gwistle rolled up his eyes and fainted away. The dwarf, dwarf had to haul him upright, while Terra and the others fanned him. At length, Gwistle opened one eye. Sorry, he gasped. Not myself today. Too bad about the cauldron. One of those unfortunate things. 
The crow, who had been watching all this activity, turned a beady glance on his owner and flapped his wings with such vigor that Gurji roused himself in alarm. Ordo! Ka croaked. Fluter turned in surprise. Well, can you imagine that? He didn't say Ka at all. At least, it didn't sound like it to me. I could have sworn he said something like, Ordu. Orwin! croaked Ka. Argok! There, said Fluter, looking at the bird with fascination. He did it again. It's strange, agreed Terran. It sounded like Ordu Orwin Orgok. And look at him, running back and forth on his perch. Do you think we've upset him? He acts as if he wants to tell us something, began Elenmi. Gwistel's face, meanwhile, had turned the color of ancient cheese. You may not want us to know, said Dolly, roughly seizing the terrified Gwistel, but he does. This time, Gwistel, I really do mean to squeeze you. No, no, Dolly, please don't do that. Anything but that, wailed Gwistel. Don't give him another thought. He does odd things. I've tried to teach him better habits, but it doesn't do any good. Please, Dolly. A flood of Gwistel's pleading and moaning followed, but the dwarf paid it no heed and began to carry out his threat. No, squealed Gwistel. No squeezing, not today. Please listen to me, Dolly. He added, his eyes crossing and uncrossing frantically. If I tell you, will you promise to leave? The dwar dwarf nodded and relaxed his grip. All Ka meant to say, Gwistel went on hurriedly, is that the cauldron is in the hands of Ordu, Orwin, and Orgok. That's all. It's a shame. There's certainly nothing to be done about it. It hardly seems worth mentioning. Who are Ordu, Orwin, and Orgok? Terran asked. His excitement and impatience were getting the better of him, and he was sorely tempted to aid Dolly in squeezing Gwistel. Who are they? murmured Gwistel. You had better ask what they are. Very well, cried Terran. What are they? I don't know, replied Gwistel. It's hard to say, really. It doesn't matter. They've got the cauldron, and you might as well let it rest there, he shuddered violently. Don't meddle with them. There's no earthly use in it. Whoever they are, or whatever they are, cried Terran, turning to the rest of the company. I say find them. Take the cauldron. That's what we set out to do, and we should not turn back now. Where do they live? They live in the marshes of Morva. It's really very vague. Most likely, yes, the Morva marshes. Ka flapped his wings again. Marva! He croaked. I mean, Gwistel moaned as the angry Dolly reached for him again. They definitely, yes, they, they stay in the marshes of Morva. Exactly where, I have no idea. No idea at all. That's the trouble. You'll never find them, and if you do, which you won't, you'll wish you never had. Gwistel wrung his bony hands, and his trembling features indeed held a look of deepest dread. I've heard of the mar marshes of Morva, Adon said. They lie to the west of here. How far, I do not know. I do, interrupted Fluter. A good day's journey, I should say. I once came upon them during my wanderings. I ca recall them quite clearly. Unpleasant stretch of country. Quite terrifying. Not that it bothered me, of course. Undaunted, I strode through. Snap! A harp string snapped abruptly with a resounding twang. I went around them. The bard corrected himself hurriedly. Dreadful, smelly, ugly-looking fens they were. But, he added, if that's where the cauldron is, then I say with Terran, go there. A phlegm never hesitates. A phlegm never hesitates to open his mouth, put in Dolly. Gwistel is telling the truth for once. I'm sure of it. I've heard tales back in Idle Egg's realm of those whatever you call them. And they weren't pleasant. Nobody knows much about them, or if they do, they aren't telling. You should pay attention to Dolly, interrupted Elenry, turning impatiently to Terran. I don't see how you can even think about getting the cauldron away from whoever has it, and not even knowing whatever has it. Besides, Elenry went on, Gwydion ordered us to meet him at Karakadarn, and if my memory hasn't got holes in it from all the nonsense I've been hearing, he didn't say a single word about going in the opposite direction. You don't understand. Terran retorted. When he told us to meet him, he was going to plan a new search. He didn't know we would find the cauldron. In the first place, Elenry said, you haven't found the cauldron. But we know where it is, cried Fluter. That's just as good. And in the second place, Elenry continued, ignoring the bard. And 
If you've got any news about it, the only wise thing is to find Gwydion and tell him what you do know. That is sense, put, the, put in Dolly. We'll have enough trouble getting to Karakadarn without splashing around in swamps on a wild goose chase. You listen to her. She's the only one, outside of myself, who has any notion of what's ought to be done. Terran hesitated. It may be, he said after a pause, that we would be wiser returning to Gwydion. King Morgant and his warriors can lend us their strength. He spoke these words with some effort in the back of his mind. He yearned to find the cauldron, to bring it in triumph to Gwydion. Nevertheless, he could not deny himself that Ellen, me, and Dully had proposed the surer plan. It seems to me, then, he began. But he had no sooner started to agree with Dully than Eladir thrust his way to the fireside. Pig boy, Eladir said, you have chosen well. Return with your friends and let us make our parting here. Parting? asked Aaron, puzzled. Do you think I would turn my back now when the prize is nearly won? Eladir said coldly. Go your way, pig boy, and I shall go mine, to the marshes of Morva themselves. Wait for me at Karakadarn. Eladir added with a scornful smile, Warm your courage beside the file. fire. I shall bring the cauldron there. Terran's eyes flashed with anger at Eladir's words. The thought that Eladir should find the cauldron was more than he could bear. I shall warm my courage, son of Penlacur, he said, in whatever fire you choose. Go back, the rest of you, if that's what you want. I was a fool to listen to the thoughts of a girl. Eladir gave a furious shriek. Dully raised a hand in protest but Terran cut him short. He was calmer now that his first anger had passed. This is not a game of courage, he said. I would be twice a fool, and so should we all, to be goaded by an idle taunt. This much, at least, I have learned from Gwydion. But there is also this. Auron seeks the cauldron even now, and we do not dare lose the time it would take to bring help. If he finds the cauldron before we do... And if he doesn't, put in Dully, how do you know he knows where it is? And if he doesn't know, how long will it take him to find out? A merry while, I'll be bound, even with all this cauldron-born huntsmen and guithanes, and what have you. There's a risk either way. Any clod clodpole can see that. But if you ask me, there's more risk than any otherwise if you go popping off into the marshes of Morva. And you, Terran of Caradolbin, said Eleni, you're only making excuses for some harebrained scheme of yours. You've been talking and talking, and you've forgotten one thing. You're not the one to decide anything, and neither are you, Eladir. A don commands you both, if I'm not mistaken. Terran flushed at Eleni's reminder. Forgive me, Adon, he said, bowing his head. I did not intend to disobey your orders. The choice is yours. Adon, who had been listening silently near the fire, shook his head. No, he said quietly. This choice cannot be mine. I have said nothing for or against your plan. The decision is greater than I dare make. But why? cried Terran. I don't understand, he said quickly and with concern. Of all of us, you know best what to do. Adon turned his gray eyes towards the fire. Perhaps you will understand one day. For now, choose your path, Terran of Caradolbin, he said. Wherever you may lead, I promise you my help. Terran drew back and stood silent a moment, filled with distress and uneasiness. It was not fear touching his heart, but the wordless sorrow of dry leaves rushing desolate before the wind. Adon continued to watch the dance of the flames. I shall go to the marshes of Morva, Terran said. Adon nodded. So it shall be. No one spoke then. Even Eladir made no reply. He bit his lips and fingered the hilt of his sword. Well, said Dolly, at last, I suppose I might as well go along too, do what I can, but it's a mistake, I warn you. Mistake, cried the jubilant bard. By no means, I wouldn't be kept away from it. And I certainly will not, declared Eleni. Someone has to make sure there are at least a few of us with good sense along. Marshes. Ugh. If you insist on making fools of yourself, I wish you'd do it in a drier way. And Gurgi? Gurgi will help, shouted Gurgi, springing to his feet. Yes, yes, with seekings and peekings. Gwistel, said Dolly with a look of resignation. You might as well go and fetch that powder you were talking about. While Gwistel eagerly rummaged through the alcove, the dwarf drew a deep breath and flickered out of sight. He was back after some length of time, fully visible and looking furious, his ears trembling and rimmed with blue. There's five huntsmen camped over the rise, he said. They've settled down for the... Oh, my ears. Settle down for the night. If that powder is any good, we can be well away before they even know we've been here. The companions dusted their feet and the hooves of their steeds with a black substance Gwistel distributed from a moldering sack. 
He seemed almost gleeful as Terran untethered Melonless and led the horse from behind the screen of brambles. Goodbye, goodbye, muttered Crystal. I hate to see you waste your time, not to mention your lives, but that's the way of it, I suppose. Here today, gone tomorrow. What's anyone to do about it? Goodbye, I hope we meet again, but really not too soon. Goodbye. With that, the portal shut. Terran took a firmer grip on the bride, bridle of Melonless, and the companions moved silently into the forest. Chapter 8 A Stone in the Shoe Outside the waypost, night had already fallen. The sky was clear once more, but the chill had deepened. Adon and Fluter held a hurried council on which path to follow, and agreed the company should ride westward until dawn, conceal themselves in sleep, then turn due south. As before, Elenwee shared Melonlass with Terran, and Gurji clung to the back of Luger. Fluter had offered to lead the way, claiming he had never been lost and could find the marshes with his eyes shut after two harp strings had snapped. He reconsidered, and gave up his position to Adon. Dully, still muttering angrily about his buzzing ears, rode last as rear guard, although he flatly refused to make himself go invisible, no matter what the circumstances. Eldir had spoken to no one since leaving the melancholy Gwistle, and Terran had seen the cold rage in his eyes after the companion's decision to press on to the marshes of Marva. I think he really would have tried to bring the cauldron back by himself, Terran said to Elenry, and you know how much chance he would have had alone. That's the kind of childish thing I'd have done when I was assistant pig keeper. What do you mean? You're still an assistant pig keeper, answered Elenry. You're going to... To these silly swamps because of Eladir, and anything else you say is pure nonsense. Don't tell me it wouldn't have been wiser to find Quidian. But no, you had to decide the other way and drag the rest of us along. Terran did not reply. Elenwee's words stung him, all the more because he had begun to regret his own decision. Now that the companions had set off, doubts tormented him, and his heart was heavy. Terran could not forget the strange tone in Adon's voice, and sought again and again to understand why he had turned from a choice rightfully his. He jogged Melonless closer to Adon, and leaned from the saddle. "'I am troubled,' he said in a low voice, "'and I wonder now if we should not turn back. I fear you have kept something from me, and had I known what it was, I would have chosen otherwise.' If Adon shared Terran's doubts, he showed no sign. In the saddle he rode unbowed, as though he had gained new strength, and the weariness of the journey could no longer touch him. On his face was a look Terran had never seen before, and could not fathom. In it was pride, yet more than that, for it was, uh, it held as well a light that seemed joyous. After a long pause, Adon said, There is a destiny laid on us to do what we must do, though it is not always given to us to see it. I think you see many things, Terran replied quietly, many which you tell no one. It has long been on my mind, he went on with much hesita hesitation. And now more than ever, the dream you had the last night in Cairdalban, you saw Eladir and King Morgant. To me, you were foretold of what I would grieve. But what did you dream of yourself? Adon smiled. Is that what troubles you? Very well, I should tell you. I saw myself in a glade, and though winter lay all around, it was warm and sunlit. Birds called and flowers sprang up from bare stones. Your dream is beautiful, said Eleni, but I can't guess its meaning. Tara nodded. Yes, it... It was beautiful. I feared it had been unhappy, and for that reason you chose not to speak of it. Adon said nothing more, and Terran fell back into his own thoughts, still finding no reassurance. Melonas moved ahead, sure-footed despite the darkness. The stallion was able to avoid the loose stones and fallen branches that lay across the winding path, even without Terran's hands on the reins. His eyes heavy with fatigue, Terran leaned forward and patted the stallion's powerful neck. Follow the way, my friend. Terran murmured, Surely you know it better than I do. At daybreak, Adon raised his hand and signaled a halt. Throughout the night they had ridden, as it seemed to Terran, down a long series of descending slopes. They were still in the forest of Idris, but here the ground had leveled a little more. Many of the trees were yet covered with leaves. The undergrowth was thicker, the land less stark than the hills around Darkgate. Dully, his pony snorting, white mist, galloped up to report no sign of the huntsmen on their trail. How long that sallow mealworm's powder lasts, I couldn't guess. 
and I don't think it'll do us ma that much good anyway. If Oron's looking for the cauldron, he's going to look hard and close. The huntsmen must know we've come in this general direction. If enough of them keep after us, sooner or later they're bound to find us. That Gwistle, for all the help he's been, huff, and his crow too, huff. I wish we couldn't run into either of them. Eladir had dismounted and was anxiously studying Islamok's left foreleg. Terran, too, swung down and went to Eladir's side. The horse whinnied and rolled her eyes as he approached. She has gone lame, Terran said. Unless we can help her, I fear she may not be able to hold the pace. I need no pig boy to tell me that, answered Eladir. He bent and examined the mare's hoof with a gentleness of touch which surprised Terran. If you lightened her burden, Terran suggested, it might ease her for a while. Fluter can take you up behind him. Eladir straightened, his eyes black and bitter. Do not give me counsel on my own steed. Islamok can go on, go on, and so she will. Nevertheless, as Eladir turned away, Terran saw his face with, fill with lines of worry. Let me look at her, Terran said. Perhaps I can find the trouble. He knelt and reached towards Islamok's foreleg. Do not touch her, cried Eladir. She will not abide a stranger's hand. Islamok reared and bared her teeth. Eladir laughed scornfully. Learn for yourself, big boy, he said. Her hooves are sharp as knives, as you shall soon see. Terran rose and grasped Islamok's bridle. For a moment, as the horse lunged, he feared she would indeed trample him. Islamok's eyes were round with terror. She wickered and struck out at him. A hoof glanced against his shoulder, but Terran did not loosen his hold. He reached up and put a hand to Islamok's long, bony head. The mare shuddered, but Terran spoke quietly and smoothingly to her. She tossed her mane, the straining muscles relaxed. The reins went loose, and she made no attempt to draw away. Without stopping the flow of reassuring words, Terran raised her hoof. As he had suspect suspected, there was a small jagged stone wedged far back behind the shoe. He drew his knife. Islamok trembled, but Terran worked deftly and quickly. The stone came free and fell to the ground. This has happened even to Melmus, Terran explained, putting the roan's flanks. There's a place deep in the hoof. Anyone can miss it if they don't know. It was Cole who showed me how to find it. Eladir's face was livid. You have tried to steal honor from me, pig boy, he said through decided teeth. Will you now rob me of my horse? Terran had expected no thanks, but the angry thrust of Eladir's words took him aback. Eladir's hand was on his sword. Terran felt a surge of answering anger, a flush rising to his cheeks. But he turned away. Your honor is your own, Terran answered coldly, and so is your steed. What stone is in your shoe, Pen Prince of Penlikur? He strode to his companions, who had taken cover in the tangle of brush. Gurji had already opened the wallet and was proudly distributing its contents. Yes, yes, cried Gurji gleefully. Crunchings and munchings for all, thanks to generous, kind-hearted Gurji. He will not let brave warriors suffer bellies filled only with howlings and growlings. Eladir remained behind, patting Lezumok's neck and murmuring in the roan's ear. Since he made no move to join the companions at their meal, Terran called out to him, but the Prince of Penlikur only gave him a bitter glance and remained with Islamok. That foul-tempered nag is the only thing he cares about, muttered the bard, and as far as I can see, the only thing that cares about him. They're two of a kind, if you ask me. Adon, sitting a little apart from the others, called Terran to him. I commend your patience, he said. The black beast spurs Eladir cruelly. I think he'll find... Like, he'll feel better once he finds the cauldron, Terran said. There will be glory enough for all to share. Adon smiled gravely. Is there not glory enough in living the day given us? You should know there is adventure in simply being among those we love, and the things we love, and beauty too. But I would speak to you of another matter, Adon went on. His handsome face, usually tranquil, was clouded. I have few possessions, for I count them of little importance, but these few I treasure. Luger, my packets of healing herbs, and this. He stead, touching the clasp at his throat. The brooch I wear, a precious gift from Arianlin, my betrothed, should any ill befall me, they are yours. I have watched you closely, Terran of Cardalbin. In all my journeys I have met no one else to whom I would rather entrust them. Do not speak of ill befalling you, Terran cried. We are companions and protect one another against dangers. Beside Adon, your friendship is gift enough for me. Nevertheless, Adon replied, we cannot know all the future holds. Will you accept them? Terran nodded. It is well, Terran said. 
Now my heart is lighter. After the meal, it was decided they would rest until midday. Eladir made no comment when Adon ordered him to stand the first watch. Terran rolled up in his cloak under the protection of a bush. Exhausted by the journey and by his own doubts and fears, he slept heavily. The sun was high when he opened his eyes. He sat up with a start, realizing his turn at guard had almost passed. Around him, the companions still slept. Eladir, he called. Why didn't you wake me? He rose hurriedly to his feet. There was no sign of Eladir or Islamuk. Terran hastily roused the others. He ran a little distance into the trees, then circled back. He's gone, Terran cried. He's gone after the cauldron alone. He said he would, and now he's done it. Stolen a march on us, has he? Grumbled Dully. Well, we'll catch up to him. And if we don't, that's his concern. He doesn't even know where he's going. And for the matter of that, neither do we. Good riddance to him, said Fluter. If we have any kind of luck at all, we may not see him again. For the first time, Terran saw deep alarm in Adon's face. We must overtake him quickly, Adon said. Eladir's pride and ambition will swallow him up. I fear to think what should happen should the cauldron come into his hands. They set off with all possible haste. Adon soon found Eladir's trail leading southward. I was hoping he might have gotten disgusted with the whole business and gone home said Fluter, but there's no doubt of it. He's heading for Morva. Despite their speed, the companions saw no sign of Eladir himself. They pressed on, urging the last strength from the laboring horses, until they were obliged to halt for breath. A cold wind had risen, swirling the leaves in great circles above their heads. I do not know if we can overtake him, Adon said. He rides as swiftly as we, and he is nearly a quarter day's journey ahead of us. His heart pounding, Terran flung himself from Malamas and slumped to the ground. He cradled his head in his hands. From a distance came the shrill call of a bird, the first bird song he had heard since leaving Cairdalban. That is not the true speech of a bird, Adans cried, springing to his feet. The huntsmen! They found us! Without awaiting Adans order, the dwarf raced in the direction of the huntsman's signal. As Terran watched, Dully vanished before his eyes. Adon drew his sword. This time we must stand against them, he said. We can run from them no longer. Quickly, he commanded Terran, Elenry, and Gurji to ready their bows, while he and the bard mounted their horses. Within moments, the dwarf was back again. Five huntsmen, he cried. Go on, the rest of you. I'll play the same trick. No, said Adon. I do not trust it to work again. Hurry, follow me. He led them through a clearing and halted at the far side. Here we make our stand, Adon said to Terran. As soon as they come in sight... Fluter, Dolly, and I will charge them from the flank. When they turn to give battle, loose your arrows. Adon swung around to face the clearing. In another instant, the huntsmen burst from cover. They had no sooner taken a stride forward than Adon gave a great cry, urged his horse across the ground. Dolly and the bard galloped beside him. Even as Terran drew his bow, Adon was in the midst of the huntsmen, striking left and right with his blade. The dwarf had pulled the stubby axe from his belt and chopped furiously at his enemies. Surprised by the fierce attack, the huntsmen spun about to engage the riders. Terran loosed his arrow and heard the shafts of Elenry and Gurji whistle past them. The flight of all three went wide, snatched by the wind and skittering among the bright brushes. Shouting madly, Gurji fitted another arrow to his bow. Three huntsmen pressed toward Fluter and the dwarf, forcing them into a thicket. Adon's sword flashed and rang against the weapon of his assailants. Now Terran dare not loose another shaft for fear of hitting one of his companions. We are fighting uselessly, he cried, and flung his bow to the ground. He unsheathed his sword and ran to Adon's aid. One of the huntsmen shifted his attack to Terran, who struck out at him with all his strength. His blow glanced from the jacket of an animal skins, but the huntsman lost his footing and dropped to earth. Terran stepped forward. He had forgotten the vicious daggers of the huntsman until he saw the man raise himself and snatch at his belt. Terran froze with horror. In front of him, he saw the snarling face with a crimson brand, the arm uplifting to throw the blade. Suddenly, Luger was between him and the huntsman. Adon rose in the saddle and swept down with his sword. As the huntsman toppled, his knife flew, glittering through the air. Adon gasped and dropped his weapon. He slumped over Luger's mane, clutching the dagger in his breast. With a cry of anguish, Terran caught him as he was about to fall. Fluter! Dolly! Terran shouted. To us! Adon is wounded! This concludes chapter 8. Thank you for listening, and remember, have a good day. You deserve it.